Hi everyone. Um, we're going to talk today about Venn diagrams and this is going to be the first of three parts about Venn diagrams and just, just the basics and how it all works. Really Venn diagrams are around to give you an a visualization of how different sets relate to each other. So let's do a few a few definitions first. Okay. A Venn diagram, it uses circles inside of a rectangle to represent relationships between sets. Now we started off with this where we asked a survey question of do you have a cat or do you have a dog or and answer yes or no to each of those. A Venn diagram is a rectangle and it has circles inside it and the, the way the circles are positioned and the number of circles and all that, it tells you the relationships between the sets. Okay. The rectangle is the universe. So the whole thing here, the rectangle, is the universe. In our particular situation, the universe for this study is students in our class. And it's students in our class who answered the survey question, but we'll, we'll break it down just a little bit. Now, each circle represents a set that exists within the universe. The size of the circle doesn't matter, that it doesn't tell you how many are in that set or anything, They're just the positioning is what really represents it for you. Okay. All right, so the circle C, what do you suppose it represents? Well, these are students that have a cat. So these are students who have a cat. The circle D represents this whole circle here. the students who have a dog. Now you will notice that these circles overlap. So why do you suppose these circles overlap? Because there are students who have both a cat and a dog. Okay. All right, so we've got our universe and we can put our universe up here our, and label it as students in our class. The circle C is the students who have a cat. The circle D is students who have a dog. When you have a rectangle and two overlapping um, circles inside, you create four distinct regions. And we just label these R1, R2, R3, and R4. There is nothing that tells you, there's no reason to put them in this order. All right, so let's look at these and describe what each region represents. So let's look at R1. R1 is all of this over here, and my coloring is not very good, but it is strictly this part here. So clearly these are students that have a cat, with a cat, but not a dog. They do not overlap the circle for dogs. So let's see how many people will fall into that region. 
Okay, so students who have just a cat. So here's one, and I don't know if this is exact. I just kind of made these up. Two, three. So there are four students who have a cat but do not have a dog. Oh, I missed one. There's five. So I'll have to change that to five. Now R2 we just identified up here, R2 is the overlap. So these are going to be students with a cat and a dog. So if I go back and look at how many people are in this category, Let's see, I have one student here who has a cat and a dog, one student here who has a cat and a dog. So there are two in this fictitious class. R3 is this region here. And this region are students that they're in the dog circle but not in the cat circle. These are students with a dog but not a cat. And if I find these on here, let's see, students who have a dog and no cat, there's one, two, three, four, five, six of them. So we've got six students who have a dog and no cat. And then finally we have this region out here And this is going to be a little bit different than the universe. It is going to be students without a dog or a cat. Now I'd like to shorten that to say students without a pet, but not all pets are included in here. It's just dogs or cats. And let's see how many we have in here. We have one, two, three, four students in here. And again, these are this is a fictitious class, so. So we have four students in this region here. And then of course you're going to figure out which region you belong in, but I actually right now belong in R4. I do, do not currently have a pet. Okay, so if you are looking at a universe, a rectangle with two circles inside of it, there can be three different relationships with the circles. You can have sets that are disjoint. These are sets with no members in common. Uh, and we'll, let's see, we can use the world of animals try to follow along with what we did in class. Now there are different types of animals and there are some that are that have nothing to do with each other. Um, we could say fish and we can say bears. You can't be a fish and a bear. Overlapping sets are sets with a member in common. Again, let's talk about animals. And let's think about fish again. 
And then we can think of another attribute that would apply to some fish and not apply to others. So I, the first thing I thought about was yellow animals. There are yellow fish and there are animals that are yellow that are not fish, a canary is the first thing that came to my mind. And again, we can think about animals again. And if you have a subset, that means that every member in this set is also a member of this set. So let's think about, um, well, let's go, let's use bears. And then the larger circle could be mammals. Every bear is a mammal. Now you can also write this as an if-then statement. If you are a bear, then you are a mammal. I don't know that bears particularly care about that. Okay, so let's do an example and see how we can identify different subsets. Notice we've got the same universe in all three of these ACC students, and we have two subsets, T and M, in both of them. Here, they don't overlap. Here, they overlap. Here, one is a subset of another. And let's see if we can figure out how they are related. Well, it's going to depend on how we define T and M. T is a set of students who are born in Texas in this first one, and M is a set of students who are multilingual, that speak more than one language. Now, are these disjoint, overlapping, or is one a subset of another? Well, these sets are overlapping, why? because a student can be born in Texas and be multilingual. Okay. Since it is overlapping, that fits into Diagram B. So we've got it set into one, two, three, four regions again. So I'm going to go back and label these four regions. R1 is students born in Texas who are not multilingual. I hope I spelled that correctly. R2 is the overlapping region. That means it, they belong to circle T and circle M. So R2 are students born in Texas and multilingual. Speak more than one language. R3 are students not born in Texas who are multilingual. And then lastly, we have our region out here, our R4, and 
R4 are going to be students not born in Texas. They are not in that circle. And not multilingual. Okay, then we can look at another set of students where our T, our set, our students born in Texas and M are the students born in Michigan. So I'm going to raise this up a little bit so we can still see everything. Okay. Let's see if I can focus it again. All right, so are these sets disjoint overlapping or is one a subset of another? These sets are disjoint. A student cannot be born in both Texas and Michigan. Now notice since we don't have that overlapping region, we have just three regions within our set, within our universe. So R1 our R1 are going to be students born in Texas Our R2, our M, our students born in Michigan, and finally our all our R3. There's still ACC students. So R3 are students not born in Texas or Michigan. Okay. Well, we've got one more, and just by, kind of by process of elimination, we know which one it's going to be. But we have this set of students born in Texas and students born in McKinney, Texas. These, one is going to be a subset of the other if you were born in McKinney then you were born in Texas and I'm abbreviating I'm sure there's McKinney's in other parts of the country and so this is going to be subset C or or um, Venn diagram C now, once again, we have three regions here. So R1 are students born in McKinney, Texas. And since they were born in McKinney, then they were also born in Texas. But now we've got this ring outside of it. And that is our region R2. These are students 
born in Texas, but not McKinney. They were born in Austin, or they were born in Hutto, where I live. Then lastly, we have this region outside of any of the circles. And these are SIL students. R3 are students, not born in Texas. They could have been born in Michigan or in somewhere else. Okay, well let's talk about how to write all this and we're going to talk about what a proposition is and just a little bit of, of logic. Propositions and compound statements. Now a proposition is just a statement that makes a clear claim and it has a truth value. It's either going to be true and false. So I can say, but it can't be both. So I can say I am a teacher at ACC. That is true. Uh, I can say I um, currently live in Lakeway. That is false. Both of those are propositions. It's a statement that makes a clear assertion and one was true and one was false. So, the word we're going to look at here is not. And not is the negation of a proposition. So, if you have the proposition, Mary is a full-time student, the negation of that proposition is Mary is not a full time student. We can't say she's part time, we can't say she's not a student at all, we just say she is not a full time student. That's the negation of that. Okay. Next we want to look at compound statements which connects two different propositions. And we're going to look at two statements within here. One is and. Both propositions must be true for the compound statement to be true. And we're also going to look at or. Either or both propositions are true for the compound statement to be true. Okay. So, now I do want to make a notation on here about what the mathematical or means. It means either or both. But there's a note here in everyday conversation, or can use the exclusive or, which means you can do one or the other. Um, like I can either have dinner at 7 o'clock or I can have dinner at 9 o'clock. I guess I could have both, but I'm only going to have dinner. If I eat dinner once one day, I'm either going to have it at 7 or at 9. In mathematics, it can be either or both. And we'll see how that works in a second. Okay, so to apply for a certain scholarship, the applicant must be a full-time student and be employed full-time. So the connector we're using here is and. And we can just call this statement A and statement B. We are using and. So, to be eligible for the scholarship, the applicant must meet both requirements. Well, let's go back up here to AND. Both propositions must be true for the compound statement to be true. 
So yes, both statements must be true. And the, no the notation for this, which we'll get to on the next page, would be A and B, which makes it true. All right, now let's consider how this statement, to apply for a certain scholarship, the applicant must be full-time or be enrolled, be a full-time student or be employed full-time. Well, which connector is being used here? The or. So to be eligible for the scholarship, the applicant must meet both requirements. That is false. If it says or, it means they have to be a full-time student. They can be employed full-time. They can be both, but they do not have to be both. If the applicant meets either requirement, can they apply for the scholarship? Yes. If they meet both requirements, can they still apply for the scholarship? Yes, they can. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead, before we go to the next example, and switch videos.